with me. He's with me from day to day. What friend is he? Watches over me while I sleep. Hears me when I pray. I'm as happy as I can be. Now I can say, somebody loves me. Answers my prayers. I love somebody. I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. You'll be happy if you will let Jesus have his way. He has work for us all to do every passing day. Feed the hungry and cheer the sad for the sinner pray. You'll have joy that you never had and you can say. Somebody loves me, answers my prayers. I love somebody, I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine. Then at last when our work is done, he will call us home. To a mansion he has prepared, never more to roam. We'll sit down by the riverside, cares all passed away. And with never a pain to bear, what a happy day. Somebody loves me, answers my prayers. All right. Well, hey, we want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Lord's Day, Cornerstone Baptist Church here in Logan, Ohio. Again, we're still kind of under that virus thing there. So other than the singers uh, joining us here, it's kind of an empty crowd. But we want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to go ahead. You know what? The reason that we do gather together together whether at home or here collectively in the body is because of what the lord jesus did for us two thousand years ago and he shed his blood for the remission of our sin and so the next song the last song we're going to sing together and if you are following us on facebook we do have the words to the songs there. i just wanted to mention that that you can we don't have the words on there okay <laughs> all right <laughs> Okay, scratch that from the record. All right, nothing but the blood.
precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, oh you've rescued the souls of men. Thank you. Let's go ahead before we uh, have our message by uh, our pastor here. Let's go ahead and open a word of prayer. Father, we just want to come before you today. And again, as unusual as it is meeting separately from our church body, Lord, we want to thank you that we can be assured from your word that your presence is with us. And so, Father, I just pray now that you would bless this time together. Be with our church family, a church body. Lord, I pray, Father, for, for their safety, their health. And now as we open up your word, we just pray that you'd bless the teaching of your word. Help us that our hearts be prepared and ready to receive it. And, Father, even more ready to apply it. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to ask our pastor to come. And the title of the message today is, Behold His Hands.
If you have your Bibles with you, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Gospel of John, chapter 20, we'll begin reading at verse 24. It's been a week since the Lord has been resurrected from the dead. And he appears the second time to his disciples in the upper room. And when he comes into a room that with barred doors, the first thing he says to his disciples, peace be unto you. And Thomas was there. And here in our scripture this morning, we read the account of that. In verse 24, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. And came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Rich, rich hither thy finger, and behold my hand, and rich hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. I believe one of the great inferences to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ is this. Had Jesus not been both Lord and God, he should have rebuked Thomas for unmitigated idolatry, when Thomas fell down before him and cried out, My Lord and my God. But he is Thomas's Lord. He is Thomas's God. And I'm here to declare this morning, He is my Lord and my God. One of the things that helped confirm the truth that Jesus truly had risen from the grave was his hands. The nailed, scarred hands. You know, I don't know why, but I'm drawn to people's hands. When you look at people's hands, that tells you something about them. I remember when my wife and I was married back in 1964, and our, at our wedding, we had a wedding picture with her hand on top of mine. She had a very youthful, pretty hand. And uh, over the years of 49, almost 49 years of marriage, uh, of course, the Lord took her home. But a few days before she took her last breath here, I laid my hands on top of her and my daughter-in-law, Alicia, took a picture of it. And you can see the difference in the hands. It tells you that if you know her, she'd been a mother. She'd been a wife. She'd been a hard worker. She'd been a servant of the Lord. And you could see the wrinkles. And and, uh, so when I shake people's hands, I'm drawn to their hands. Some hands are calloused hands. Some hands are soft. Some hands have a just a natural beauty of youth, but some has for time has taken toll. And in our scriptures this morning, I just want you to see, behold his hands. There are three things that the hands of Jesus speak to us about today. Three things. And I hope the message would be a blessing to you. 
First of all, the hands of Jesus. When you look at his hands, it will remind us that he suffered. Beyond the shadow of any doubt, Jesus suffered. Now, suffering and pain are problems, and quite frankly, we as believers have uh, a problem with it, to deal with it. So many times Christians have pain, and, and it seems to be most unbearable. Or they see one of their loved ones, a child perhaps, or uh, a loved one, a parent, a mom and dad, and they're suffering, and, and we just want to cry out, Oh God, please do something about it. Or we say, Oh God, please remove this pain. And oftentimes it doesn't seem to come. In fact, it seems to go the other way. And then doubts begin to settle in and we begin to have a battle in our minds. Often we wonder why so much pain and suffering in the lives of people. And I understand the feelings and the whys that all have concerning human suffering. But I tell you, and that's, and we ought to think about that, but that leads me to say that we ought to think about a greater question. Not only why is there so much suffering in the world, but the question should be is, why did God suffer? Why does he still suffer? Those wounds, behold his hands, will remain visible in his hands, I believe, throughout eternity. And they will remind us that he suffered, but not only did he suffer, but he suffered with us every moment. God speaks in Jeremiah 13, 20. He's talking of the tribe of Ephraim, which was often referred to as northern Israel. And he says, Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? Now, God never called an individual a son in the Old Testament, but he did call the tribes. A son and Ephraim has rebelled against God. He's broken the heart of God. He said, For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Even though I've had to discipline him, I remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. That is, I hurt. God is saying, I hurt in the pit of my stomach. For my son. I mean, whoever has had a child had done wrong or gone wrong, and everyone who has raised a child to maturity at some time or another have had that sick pit in the stomach for that child. He's hurt. He's hurting. God says, I hurt. Now, when we have pain, we normally don't choose it. And sometimes we can do absolutely nothing about it. But God could have done something about it. Though he is God, yet he chose to suffer. Almighty God chose to suffer. And it's amazing to think God in his eternal wisdom chose to suffer. Because he had made himself a father because he is our Father God through the new birth. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You can't be a father or a mother without suffering. The story of the prodigal son gives us a glimpse into the heart of our Heavenly Father. When his son went wavered, I believe the, the father waited each day for his son's return. His heart longed and grieved for him. And when that day came, when he finally saw him coming afar off, he ran to him. He ran to him, the Bible tells us, and he fell upon him, embraced him, and kissed him. That's how our father feels. Yes, parents grieve over the children. 
the Holy Spirit grieves over us. Your car can vex you, but your children grieve you. I believe grieve is a love word. God suffers as a father when his children do wrong. Behold his hands. God suffered. And as a father, he still suffers. I want you secondly to see with me when you look at his hands, they remind us that he knows, he cares, and he feels sympathy for you and I. He feels our pain. Now Hebrews 4, 16, or four fifteen rather, the Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling. He cannot be touched. He can't be not touched by the feelings of our infirmities, is what he's saying. As a father, he feels the pain and the hurts and the discouragements that we feel. He feels those. He sympathizes with us. Jesus in a human body suffered and he feels exactly what you feel. Now that's hard for us to grab a hold of that. But the Bible said he feels what we feel. Those wounds that he took back to glory when he resurrected and sent it back to heaven remind us that he has been here on this sin-cursed earth and he's taken our sin upon himself and he paid the penalty for our sin. I think about Zechariah in chapter 13, verse 6. The Bible says that when he returned back to heaven, somebody asked him, what are those wounds in your hands? He said, those are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Jesus walked those dusty roads of Galilee up and down the valleys and the mountainsides. He walked by the graveside of Lazarus at Bethany. He walked upon the cobblestones of Jerusalem. And when he saw the city, when he came out around Mount Olives there on Palm Sunday, when he looked upon the city and the sun uh, glanced off of those white stones, the Bible said, when Jesus saw the city, he wept over it. Now, he wasn't weeping over the buildings. He wasn't weeping over the temple. He was weeping over people, lost people, without a shepherd. When I think about it, oh, how far we have come from the place of weeping over lost souls. How long has it been since you've had to really, I mean, you wept over somebody who was lost. You know, we weep over lost buildings. We weep over lost material things but we don't weep over lost souls anymore. How far we have been, how far we have come from where we ought to have been. I remember back when I first got saved, back in 1969, when I got in the Bible preaching church and they'd have an invitation. I wasn't used to invitation. And it seemed like that time people would come freely to the altar and get saved. And I know when they would come, I mean, they'd be weeping. I'd be standing back there weeping too, crying over the fact they're just getting saved. But I'm sorry to say that as the years have rolled on, it seemed like it's my eyes are dry. Where they need to weep. We need to weep. Jesus wept. The hands of Jesus tells us that when we when we suffer, when we hurt. He feels our pain and he remembers that we are only dust and clay. He remembers that. And those wounds in his hands are a lasting reminder of his humanity. And they tell us that the pain of man has become the pain of God. 
They speak to us of the greatness of His love. And whether you understand all about pain or not, His hands tell us that in all our affliction, in loving us, He feels what we feel. You, your parents, your grandparents, when your children get hurt or they do something wrong and you have to discipline them, I tell you, it, it just gets in the pit of your heart and your stomach. It just tears you up because you hurt because you're hurting. Oftentimes, my grandsons and the oldest is autistic and he does things sometimes. We don't know why he does them. But some things you have to discipline him. Some things are just plain dangerous. And I hear him cry. He's not abused, but he is corrected. And I'm telling you, when I hear him cry, it just gets pit in my stomach. He feels pain. I feel his pain with him. I know years ago, because I was raised in foster homes and my foster mom used to say, now this, when she would spank me, she did it with a peach tree limb. She said, now this hurts me more than you. I could never understand that. Because it sure was hurting at the time I was getting it. But I understand today. But why does God allow humanity to suffer? That's a good question. Why does God allow us to have wounds that turn to scars? Well, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, <clears throat> the dawn of civilization, after Adam and Eve had fallen into sin, God came to the garden. And God, by the way of a sacrifice, forgave their sin. And God made it right. But then God said to Adam and Eve, He said, and concerning the ground, He said, Cursed is the ground. For thy sake, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Now, watch this. God did not say that the ground was cursed for their judgment. He said the ground was cursed for their sake. Because he loved them. Church, the cruelest thing that God could do for falling humanity would be to allow them to continue to live in a painless world. To sin and not feel the pain. I believe in some way pain is a gift to tell you and I that something is wrong. And so pain is proof that God loves us. He took our pain. Now, when you think about pain, as one, as you look and behold the hands of Jesus, and you know he, he knows, he cares, he feels the sympathy, our pain. I said pain could be a gift from God, and you say how? But well, first of all, pain has a protecting purpose. Have you ever turned your ankle and gone down? I mean, just like that in split seconds. There is a defense mechanism in your body when your body senses that strain on the ankle immediately. Then just like that, faster than any computer can work, a message sent to the brain and back again and tells the, the thigh, tells the calf, take the weight off your foot. You're going down. Now, that actually happened to me last July. And just in a split second, with I, I, we have a trampoline for the boys, and and we have someone come mow our yard, and so I try to pull the trampoline out of our yard, and there's a open field behind my house, but they mow it, and I pulled it out of an open field so our mowers could mow. Then at at uh, noon, I saw one of the neighbors mowing that back part, and there's my trampoline out there. So I thought, well, I'll go out there and pull that trampoline back in. The yard all had my socks on. And I stepped off of the deck and it wouldn't make two or three steps. And all of a sudden, my feet went up from underneath me. And I sat down hard on my foot and leg underneath me. And I sat there and 
First of all, I looked around to see if anybody was looking. And so happened the neighbor lady was out there mowing, so I kind of, I said, boy, I need a little help here. And I didn't feel any pain. And I waved at her, and uh, now here's this 300-pound moose laying on the ground in the middle of the day. And I'm waving at her, and she just waves back at me and keeps on mowing. So I thought, well, I'll pull myself back up. So I grabbed hold of the deck, and I pulled myself up. And I said, boy, I, I don't feel any pain. When I looked down at my foot, my foot was east and west. And it was just dangling. I said, oh, my goodness, why don't I feel that? But I have neuropathy in my feet. And so I call for John, and he comes around. But meanwhile, when he's coming, I just kind of lift my foot up, and, and apparently the muscles, the ligament, pull my foot back in place, but it's kind of dangling. And without thinking, I have no pain. I tried to shift my weight, and when I put my foot down, I heard something crunch. And to this day, after the even going to the hospital, and they're setting it in the operation, and Brian, you will appreciate this, because he's just done the same thing. But unlike me, he has the pain. I had no pain. I've not had pain to this day. And so I spent two weeks, over two weeks in the hospital. It wasn't because I had pain in my foot, because my body began to fall apart. Now I'm just telling you, normally speaking, now if you feel pain, I mean that is a protective thing that tells you to get the weight off. Now, I just think about what the Scripture says, that thou art fearfully and wonderfully made. God God made that we would feel pain to protect us. And then something else, pain has a unifying purpose. Pain has a way of unifying the body. You see, if members of the body could not feel, then they would not know that they're members of the body. My hands and I, I told you, my feet, I have no feeling in my feet. I have no feelings in my hands. I have neuropathy in my hands. Now, let me ask you, are my feet healthy? Are my hands healthy? No. I have scars. I have band-aids now. In fact, I got up this morning and I had blood on the sheets because I had burned myself several days ago and didn't know I burned it. And I have to wear a band-aid to keep it from bleeding. Now, my hands are not healthy. But let me ask you something. Jesus likens the church, the body of Christ, into like our body. When one member suffers, we all should suffer. When one member feels the pain, the Bible says we ought to be able to come alongside and with sympathy feel that pain. <clears throat> Isn't that true? Now let me ask you, my feet are not healthy. My hands are not healthy. Is a church healthy does not feel the pain of each other? What about the elderly? What about those who have been abandoned? What about the, the child who has no parents? What about homes that's being wrecked and marriages? How about those who have fallen into sin? How should we feel as members of the body? Should we not come alongside? Don't mean that you excuse it. Don't mean you grieve with it. But that's a member. The body needs help, needs healing. I want you to know Jesus Feels our pain. Have you ever hit your thumb on a with a hammer? I mean, that, I mean, back then when I had feeling, I mean, that really hurt. And uh, the first thing you do, you take it, grab a hold of it, and then you stick it in your mouth, and then you do a little jig. Little, now, what in the world's dancing do to help your thumb? It don't help your son one bit. But I, I just, it just tells you, hey, I feel your pain. My feet are telling my thumb, I feel the pain. Folks, let me tell you, we need to feel the pain. I believe because the Bible says iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we get so bogged down in our own problems and hurts and things, we don't sense the pain of others. Pain has a unifying force. 
and the ability to feel pain in the physical body is a mark of hell. When people are, when a church is a praying church, when a church cares for one another, it's a healthy church. Now, we don't go through this life without pain. We don't go through this life without hurts. And I, I feel sorry for the believer who's got so discouraged and they got out of church and they don't have the church body around them. You see, I believe God designed that in the body is body that we feel each other's pain and we would pray and lift up each other. Now, there's a unifying purpose. Thirdly, thir thirdly pain has a correcting purpose. I mean, you put your hand on a hot stove and immediately, I mean, there's a thing goes to your brain and says, get your hand, it's hot. Amen? Then after you take it off and you fix it all up, then your brain said, stupid. You should have put your hand on that stove. Now, I burned myself. I don't know. I really don't know how I burned myself because I don't cook very much anymore. And, but I end up with blisters and apparently they're burns. I don't know. That can be dangerous, couldn't it? If you got infections. You see, dear friend, why does God allow us to live in a world that is cursed with pain? Because what we call cursing is somewhat of a blessing. The worst thing God could do, I, I say again, the worst thing God could do to sinful, fallen humanity would be for them to live in a world unable to feel pain. Pain will never be removed until sin is eradicated. And then pain will be removed because pain is God's message to fallen, broken humanity, that something is desperately wrong. I like what John said. In John chapter 21, verse 4, just about the end of the book. And God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Now notice, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Sin has been dealt with. The tempter has been dealt with. We have, we are made new from top to bottom, inside and out. And we'll never know what pain. I can't fathom that, can you? I won't know what sorrow is anymore. I won't know what discouragement and regret is anymore. But that's what he said. There'll be no more pain. But you say, why? But why, preacher, do little children suffer? Sin is so indiscreet. Suffering is so indiscriminate. That's the unfair thing about sin. But God has warned us that something is tragically wrong with this universe. When you hear about a child dying or killed, it just it breaks your heart. When you see on Facebook, I see sometimes pictures of little babies laying in Intensive care units. This one little baby had a heart surgery I saw the other day and had and then contacted the coronavirus. I mean, I just can't imagine the pain and the suffering that the family is going through. But what does that say to us when we think about the wounds in his hands? Those nail pierced hands. They tell us that he suffered. But not only do they tell us that he suffered, they also tell us that he willingly and voluntarily identified himself with our humanity. That he might bear the load and that he might share the load with us. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. Don't. Lastly. Lastly always has a nice ring to it. Behold his hands. I think thirdly, when you look at his hands, it reminds us he has conquered. He has conquered. I remind you that those wounds in his hands after the resurrection were not raw nor bleeding. Those wounds were healed. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him, and with his stripes 
we are healed. Church, there is victory in those wounded hands. There is healing in those wounded hands. His wounds are eternal reminder that our sin debt has been paid in full of Calvary. We didn't have to suffer. He didn't have to suffer. But he chose. He chose to because he chose to love us. And he chose to lay his life down for us. I like the song, He was the giver. I was the taker. He was the sacrifice. And I was the guilty. There's a song my daughter sings, His life for mine. He gave His life for mine. He loved me. But I honestly can say, oh, how can that be? I say within my own self, how can that be? One young man had wronged his father so many times and the father had been patient, so loving, forgiving toward his son. And finally a friend came to him and said, if that were my son, I'll tell you what I'd do. And then he proceeded to tell him what he would do. And the father with a broken heart said, I can understand that. And he said, if he were your son, that's what I'd do. But he said, he's not your son. He's my son. And that's the difference. Folks, the Bible tells us that God so loved us. Didn't say he just loved us. He so loved us that he was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. That's what the cross is all about. He loved us with a great love. Many people don't understand that several years ago I had read a article about the a talk host uh, person, TV talk host, that was Phil Donahue. And Phil Donahue was discussing the disenchantment with Christianity. This is what he said, and I quote, How could an all-loving God allow his son to be murdered on a cross in order to redeem my sin? If God the Father is so all-loving, why didn't he come down and go to Calvary? Unquote. But that is exactly what he did. That's what God did. God is an eternal spirit according to John 4. An eternal spirit cannot die. So God took on human form by the way of a virgin birth and became man. And now the man can die. That was God on the cross. Jesus Christ is God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. His hands will forever bear the visible wounds as the emblem of his humanity and passion from his visit to planet Earth. Behold his hand. Let me conclude by saying, if you follow Jesus, you too are going to have scars. Paul said in the book of Galatians 6.17, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He literally meant marks. He literally meant scars and wounds because he had been beaten. He had been whipped and stoned. He had scars all over his body. And I could see him open his robe and said, I, I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now when he used that word marks, that word for marks in the Greek is the stigmata. I bear the stigmata of Christ. And that's where we get our word stigma. I bear my body the stigma. What did Paul do with those marks? I tell you what, Del, he used them to preach with. He used them to authenticate the gospel he was preaching. Wounds you receive from suffering will in time heal. They may be your greatest testimony for Jesus Christ. The things that convinced Thomas that night and the disciples the first night were his hands. 
his wounds. His wounds. And by and may I say, your wounds and my wounds may be a message that God will use to convince someone that you care enough. Your wounds and my wounds may be enough to convince somebody that Jesus loves them and what you're telling them is true and that you've overcome. God will use it. Back in my college days and before I went there, there had been a student and his wife and had a daughter that uh, had been uh, brutally raped and murdered. They, sometimes later, years later, they caught uh, the culprit who'd done that, and they, my understanding, they put him in Leavenworth Prison, Kansas. Now, this was a testimony at the college that the father of this little girl, sometime after, he went to Leavenworth to face the man who took his daughter's life. Instead of cursed demon, he went there to tell him he forgave him. Now, I don't, I believe in forgiveness. I believe you cannot but forgive. But I can't honestly say I understand the depth of that kind of forgiveness. But because Jesus Christ had forgiven him of his debt, he forgave this man. You see, he had a wound. He had a deep wound. And the testimony is that man cried out for forgiveness from that man and from God. And that man got saved. Even though he paid it with his life, yet God forgave him. Is there one listening today that will put their hand by faith in the hand of that's forever nail scarred. Realize today that Jesus had died for them. And his wounds are the mark of his love and compassion for you. I'm just asking you, do you hold his hands? And maybe today there's a child of God. You have been wounded in your walk and service for the Lord. Today, in your hurting, don't turn away from him. Don't turn from him. Give him your discouragement. Give him your hurts and pains. And I promise you, he will embrace you. He will embrace you. Thomas had been discouraged. That's the reason why he wasn't there the first night of the resurrection. All week long he went out. He had to live without the encouragement that Jesus gave the disciples in the upper room. He was so discouraged that he said, no, I'm not going to believe it. But I'll tell you what, you know, if you're saved, you can't stay there forever. So he showed back up on the second Sunday. And the first thing Jesus said after he greeted him with peace, Thomas, come here. Come here, put your finger in the hole of my hand, thrust your hand on my side, and don't you disbelieve. And Thomas meekly fell at his feet and said, My Lord and my God. Maybe you do that today. You know him as your Savior, but you're like Thomas. You let the discouragement take over. Behold his hands. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you for loving us with such a love and you proved it at Calvary. You proved it when you outstretched arms and you took our whipping. You took our sin debt. And you paid a debt you did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. And Father, I pray for that one who may be listening today that they would place their faith in the hands of Jesus Christ. Trust him and believe him. I pray my brother, sister in Christ who have lovingly tried to serve you but they've been heartbroken, they've been discouraged and nothing seems to make sense but I pray 
with the faith they used to believe, that you gave them to believe on you. And Lord, they will turn to you now. And like Thomas, my Lord and my God. And we thank you for what you do. And I would pray for anyone who would pray and ask Christ to, as their Savior. Anyone who, who needs encouragement. And if we've been a blessing to you, in the comment section of the Facebook, you might just put a note. We thank you for, for all those working behind the scenes. And we'll be grateful. And we'll thank the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to, I wanted to just announce, Lord willing, and we don't know when this thing's going to break, we get to come together. But next Sunday, I want to preach a message I preached a long time ago. It's entitled, Hell is Like Heaven. Unusual message. Hell is like heaven. Until then, God bless you. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, a Bible study here. See you then. God bless you.